Your party enters a dimly lit chamber, the air thick with dust and the scent of ancient stone. Before you all stretches a vast floor laid out in a grid of large square tiles. Some of the tiles are etched with strange symbols while others appear plain. At the far end of the room, a massive stone door looms, its surface adorned with runes that glow faintly in the low light. As you step closer, the rogue, keen-eyed and cautious, notices faint scorch marks on some of the tiles, as if something had gone terribly wrong for those who had come before you. It's trapped. She mutters, eyes narrowing as she crouches down to inspect the floor. The wizard steps up beside her, his staff glowing softly as he examines the room. It's a safe path puzzle, he says, stroking his beard. I read about these when I was still a student. One wrong step, and it could trigger, well, anything. The party pauses, tension thick in the air. The cleric grips his holy symbol, ready to heal any wounds, while the fighter draws his sword, prepared to defend against whatever might spring from the walls. You, ever vigilant, knock an arrow and scan the chamber for potential threats. The wizard studies the runes on the distant door, mumbling incantations under his breath as he tries to decipher their meaning. These symbols, they might be a clue, he says. But the path isn't clear. We need to figure out which tiles are safe to step on. The rogue, taking the lead, carefully taps on one of the plain tiles with the end of her dagger. Nothing happens. She then touches one of the etched tiles, a symbol resembling a coiled serpent. A low rumble echoes through the chamber and the tile begins to glow ominously. She quickly retracts her dagger and the glow fades. Not that one, she says, eyes wide. The wizard peers at the glowing symbol. It could be a hint. Serpents often symbolize danger or deceit. Perhaps a safe path is marked by a different symbol. One that represents safety or protection. The group huddles together, discussing their options. The fighter suggests testing tiles with a long pole, while the cleric recommends using divine guidance to sense any malevolent magic. You, however, notice a pattern in the symbols. Those resembling natural elements like trees, mountains, and rivers are spaced in a rough line leading to the door. Nature's often seen as a source of life. You point out, what if the safe path is marked by these symbols? With cautious optimism, the rogue steps onto a tile bearing the image of a tree. The tile remains steady, and no trap is triggered. She exhales in relief. The wizard nods, his eyes gleaming with confidence. I think you're right. Follow the path of nature. One by one, the party moves forward, stepping only on tiles marked with natural symbols. Each step is taken with care, the adventurers holding their breath as they cross the perilous floor. The rogue leads, her sharp senses and nimble feet guiding her safely from tile to tile, followed by the wizard, the cleric, yourself, and the fighter, who keeps a watchful eye on the surroundings. As you all near the door, the path grows narrower and the symbols more difficult to decipher. The rogue hesitates before the final tile, a faint doubt gnawing at her. But your steady voice reassures her, and with a deep breath, she steps onto the last tile, a river symbol. The ground remains firm. The stone door groans and slowly slides open, revealing the way forward. The party exchanges relieved glances, their trust in each other solidified by the successful navigation of the deadly puzzle. The rogue flashes a grin over her shoulder. Just another day in the life of adventurers, Right? With the puzzle behind them, the adventurers step through the door, ready to face whatever challenges lie ahead, their bond strengthened by the peril they have overcome together. In this episode, we'll be talking about basic puzzles, puzzle design, and how to implement them into your own games. When we look up the definition of puzzle, we're greeted with two popular definitions. We have the verb, which is to cause someone to feel confused because they cannot understand or make sense of something, or the noun, 
which says that it's a game, toy, or problem designed to test ingenuity or knowledge. So puzzles are essentially games which are made to test ingenuity, knowledge, and to confuse the vic- I mean participant or participants. There are many opinions regarding puzzles in D&D, and we'll try to go over most if not all of them. So why would we ever want to add puzzles into our campaigns? Much like in my episode talking about traps, puzzles inherently bring in variety. It diversifies and enhances the game loop of roleplay, combat, explore, roleplay, combat, explore. You can essentially treat puzzles as their own type of encounter or pseudo-encounter. See, Dungeons & Dragons does an amazing job laying out coherent rules for almost everything, from how to build campaigns, navigating unusual environments, combat rules, world building, but nothing about puzzles. Trust me, I checked, and the closest thing we get is page 120 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, where they talk about traps. Surprise, traps aren't puzzles. They're often used in tandem with one another, but that doesn't always have to necessarily be the case. A really good reference book is The Game Master's Book of Traps, Puzzles, and Dungeons by Jeff Ashworth. I'm not sponsored by them or anything, I'm just giving credit where credit is due. It's a great book with a lot of pre-made scenarios for you, and you can plug and play it into your campaigns where they seem appropriately fit. If you don't want to buy a hardcover book, then there's tons of free things online, just a few Google searches away. If you don't want to do either of those things, then keep listening as I explain my thought process behind puzzle design. To reiterate my point from the episode of Designing Traps, it's my belief that puzzles delay and traps deter. The range for both of these things can go from minor inconvenience to permanent resolutions. A trap can kill you, just like a failed attempt at a puzzle can lock down whatever it was you were trying to get forever by some arcane or physical mechanism and everything in between. Now let's talk about the thought process behind puzzle design and implementation. The most important thing to remember when it comes to puzzles is that they're meant to be solved. I'm not saying it should be easy, but it shouldn't be impossible. You can actually expand that line of thinking out to pretty much everything that is somewhat tricky or hidden that you've decided to add into your campaigns. If you add a secret treasure, it's because you want it to be found. If you add a secret passageway, it's because you want it to be found and explored. If you add a puzzle to your game, you want it to be solved. If any of those things are impossible to find or complete, then there was never really any point in adding it to the equation in the first place. It's like it never existed. If something is put into the campaign that the players never see or interact with, did it ever really exist? The answer is no, it didn't, because the game is for them. Just because you know it's there doesn't really matter, you know everything that's happening. So we gotta make sure that we're adding things that the players can interact with, find, and solve. Another important thing to consider is the vehicle of delivery and the context regarding your campaign and how it's being run or played. What I mean by context is that you need to keep in mind if your campaign is in person, online with a virtual tabletop like Roll20, online without a virtual tabletop but still with a voice chat, or completely via text. Each of those lend themselves to some types of puzzles over others. So what do I mean by the vehicle of delivery? Well, simply put, are you going to use some kind of visual aid, or are you going to be doing all of this theater of the mind? There are pros and cons to each, so let's talk about them. Visual aids have the benefit of being able to be done with pretty much all styles of play, unless you're in a truly text-based campaign online. I don't see that too often or really play in them, but they do exist. This is something like you describe a series of garbled letters on the wall, and then you can display that to your players or put out a prop on the table for them to physically inspect. If you're using physical props, keep in mind they are something that is pretty much exclusive to in-person games. The benefits for this is that they can just be really fun. The more senses you're able to add to a scenario, the more memorable it becomes, and if done correctly, really helps with immersion and brings that wow factor to a game. There's a reason why Disney World has rides where they pump in different smells. It's because the more senses that get activated, the better. 
The downsides to a physical prop, however, are that it costs more for the GM to produce, be that time, money, or typically both. Keep in mind that if it's executed poorly, the game has essentially switched over from D&D into putting an actual puzzle together. I've seen that more than a couple times. It's a fine line you have to balance on, but the payoff can be great and become a memory you and your friends have for years to come. It can also just turn into a decoration that someone keeps at their house once the campaign's over. Theater of the Mind. It's fast, it's flexible, it doesn't take up any physical space, and most importantly, it's free. It can also be done in literally all styles of play from in-person to purely text-based games. The big negative that comes inherently with anything regarding Theater of the Mind, however, is that it is completely dependent on my ability, the GM's ability to describe it appropriately in a way that isn't misleading and gives all necessary context. So, if you aren't very good at describing and explaining things, you may find yourself struggling to come up with puzzles and may often find yourself defaulting to riddles. Riddles are cool, but they're only one type of puzzle. We can't afford to limit ourselves to one thing because by the third riddle, players are going to start to check out, unless they're fighting against a bad guy like the Riddler, but that's a niche scenario you'd have to set up beforehand. Much like with traps, we don't just want to slap our puzzles anywhere and everywhere. Ideally, they're theme appropriate and at least reskinned for the setting that they're set in. If your players find themselves navigating an encounter involving a high level magic user, they're probably going to be using magic themed or knowledge based puzzles. Whereas a Thieves Guild themed encounter may center a lot of its puzzles around ciphers, cryptography, and symbology. Keep these things in mind and try to find the right puzzle for the right job. I'm of the opinion that you can basically just consider riddles to be the pit trap of puzzles. They're tried and true and they work for almost everything. They can be reskinned to be theme appropriate and they're extremely versatile. Don't be afraid to use them, just be mindful not to overuse them. As I've said before, it'd be wrong for me to just give all these concepts with no examples. So let's talk about different types of puzzles. Examples of puzzles. At number one, we have riddle based puzzles. This one is called Riddle Statues and the scenario is as follows. The adventurers enter a grand hall filled with ancient statues, each holding a different object. A sword, a book, a shield, and a chalice. The door on the far side of the hall is locked with no visible means of opening it. As the party approaches, the statues animate and begin to speak in unison, presenting a riddle. I am the key to knowledge, the shield against ignorance. Which of us will open the way? The players must solve the riddle by choosing the correct statue. If they select the statue holding the book, the door will unlock. Choosing incorrectly could trigger a trap or summon guardians. It's up to you. At number two, we have what is called an environmental puzzle. This one in particular is a weight balance puzzle, and the scenario is as follows. The adventurers enter a large chamber with a massive scale in the center. On one side of the scale is a heavy stone weight, and on the other side, an empty platform. The far door is sealed shut with an inscription that reads, Balance must be restored for the way to be revealed. The players must find objects in the room or even use themselves to balance the scale. They need to consider the weight of each item they place and ensure that the scale tips evenly. Once the scale is balanced, the door will unlock, allowing the party to continue. If I were you, I'd recommend just writing down the actual weight of the stone that's on this scale and then the approximate weight of the things that are in the room, as well as getting the weight from players should they decide to incorporate themselves in the equation. You also need to pay careful mind when describing the scale moving when weight is added to it. The only way to punish them is if they put way too much weight on the scale and it causes it to tip completely, so you don't want to mislead them and have them feel cheated whenever a failure happens. If the Goliath steps on the scale and it barely moves, that gives them a pretty rough idea of what kind of weight they're working with. For number three, we have time-based puzzles. This one is specifically a timed lock, and the scenario is that the party reaches the end of a long corridor 
where they find a door with multiple locks. Nearby, an hourglass is embedded in the wall, slowly trickling sand into its base. The door has several keyholes, and a series of levers and switches are positioned around the room. The players have a limited amount of time to figure out the correct combination of levers and switches to unlock the door before the sand in the hourglass runs out. If they fail to unlock the door in time, it could seal permanently, or the room might begin to fill with a dangerous substance like gas or water. Now that we've kind of got our brains in a puzzle making mode, here's a quick and fun idea. The entire dungeon design can be the clue to answering the puzzle correctly. So number four, we have a memory based puzzle which I call the One True King. The scenario is that the parties navigated and fought their way through two rooms and find themselves in a third. The first room was completely colored in red, the second in blue, and the third room is equal parts red and blue. In this third room, you see three thrones with skeletons sitting in each. There are no discernible differences between the three except one thing. The leftmost skeleton has one ruby eye and one sapphire eye, the middle skeleton has two ruby eyes, and the rightmost skeleton has two sapphire eyes. At the foot of each of these skeletons, you see a space that could fit the feet and one fist of a medium sized creature. Off to the side you see a brief message on a plaque and it says, Courtesy, an important thing, respect them all, and bend the knee. Finally, honor the one true king. It's a simple puzzle for the players to solve if they've been paying attention to their surroundings and take the time to read the instructions. It isn't time based and they either get it right or they don't. Each failure should result in some kind of penalty, and the more times they fail, the worse those penalties become. Trying to pluck the eyes is almost impossible, but does result in an instant failure. Once the players kneel before each skeleton in the order of the rooms they entered to get there, so red, blue, and then both, a hidden door opens up to reveal the one true king's treasure. So we have a few types of puzzles and ways to solve them. Cool. Now what? Well, we put them into appropriate encounters and remember they're meant to be solved. Just because it took you forever to think up and design a puzzle doesn't mean it takes forever to solve it. It may be completed in the first try within a couple minutes, and that's okay. Just keep that in mind and assume all of your puzzles will be solved instantly. They won't, but you won't be scrambling to improvise the rest of the session on the chance that it is. Also, reward the players when they come up with out-of-the-box answers to the questions you're asking them. Keep in mind your players' characters have powers. If you designed a puzzle that's centered around a lock, and one of your players cast the knock spell on it, then there's three ways that you can respond to this. One, it works, the puzzle's solved instantly, and you'll remember that for next time that you design a puzzle. Two, it doesn't work, and you need to come up with some kind of reason for why that is the case, and your player feels bad but they'll live with it, it's not the biggest deal. Or my favorite, which I call the yes and, I'm pretty sure that's just an improv exercise. Number three, it works, but not completely. Sure, they knocked it and it solved one part of this lock, but it looks like there's two more to go. Now the tension's cranked up because they don't really know the mechanism behind how the lock puzzle works, and spell slots are being used up to try and bypass it. It's a response that makes sense and is more satisfactory than a plain old, no, it doesn't work because magic. So we've talked about the thought process behind puzzle design, things to keep in mind when making and implementing them, and the reason why we put them into our campaigns at all. It's to keep things fresh and fun and they're meant to be solved. We've also gone over a few examples of some puzzles that you can take home today, free of charge, and put into your campaign immediately if it fits. Like most things I talk about in my D&D episodes, I make these episodes a bit vague on purpose because my goal is to get you to add whatever it is into your own campaign and give you the tools to begin homebrewing your own versions so that they're truly tailor-made for whatever scenario your players have found themselves in. That concludes this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you enjoyed it, then like, subscribe, and share the podcast with your friends. 
This is Myths, History, and D&D, and I hope you tune in next time.